For the Wild podcast is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation and listeners like you. Calliopeia supports projects interweaving spirituality, culture, and ecology. We are grateful for their support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners. To learn more about the Calliopeia Foundation, visit calliopeia.org. To make a donation to For the Wild, visit forthewild.world slash donate or support us through Patreon. Welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Anna Yvette Martinez. Anna Yvette, co-founder and CEO of Programs and Communications of the Radical Monarchs, is a San Francisco native and child of Central American immigrants. We underestimate our young people, and so I think that it's so important for us to just listen to them and let them lead. And then, equally as important, to partner with them and to support them, to ask them, what are the things that I can do as an adult ally to support you, right? Or to help you achieve this goal or this dream or this change that you want to see happen in your community, in your school, in your neighborhood. Anna Yvette's varied interest in advocacy, community organizing, and empowerment led her to pursue her undergraduate degree at the University of California, Los Angeles, and later her master's degree at San Francisco State University in ethnic studies. Over the past 15 years, she has developed and managed education, social justice, and gender support programs focused on the empowerment and safety for youth, families, and their adult allies. Anna Yvette currently lives and loves in East Oakland with her two children. Well, welcome to For the Wild podcast, Anna Yvette. This is so lovely to have you here, and I'm really excited to be speaking to you about the Radical Monarchs. And when I first heard of them, I was so struck by the organization's differentiation between service and justice. So to begin, I'd love if you could share the mission of Radical Monarchs, how it started, and perhaps also the importance of teaching our young ones that being in service is not the same as addressing injustice. Yes, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. So the mission of the Radical Monarchs is to create opportunities for young girls of color to form fierce sisterhood, celebrate their identities, and contribute radically to their communities. And the way the Radical Monarchs came about is really personal and organic. So I'm a mother. And when my daughter was in fourth grade, a bunch of her classmates were joining a local traditional scouting troop. And so naturally, she wanted to join to be with her friends. And so she asked me if she could join. And when I looked at the composition of the troop, I noticed that she would have been only one of two girls of color. And two, the traditional kind of scouting model was something that I was never raised with, right? And so it didn't really have a presence in my home or in my community, in my neighborhood. And my daughter has been raised in a very like radical, political, social justice household. And so I felt like that kind of traditional space wouldn't speak to her experience as one, a young girl of color, and two, as a young girl that's been really raised in a politicized family. And so I started to think about what would it look like to start a troop that took from traditional elements of scouting in terms of camaraderie and like sisterhood and the idea of earning badges. But what if all of that centered young girls of color and their experiences and that the badges were actually based on social justice movement work? And so I had this idea. And so I went back to my daughter and I was kind of like, you know, I don't know about you joining that troop, but what if mommy were to like do this little troop for you and some of your friends, you know? And I kind of told her my idea and she instantly lit up and was like, yes, mommy, that's what I want to do. Can we do that? And I was like, sure. Okay, let's do it. And then at the time I was working at a nonprofit doing community work. And as you know, those types of jobs are not nine to five jobs. And so I was incredibly busy with my job, with being a parent and having a family. And my daughter never let go of that idea. She constantly would be like, mommy, when are we starting that group? And she was starting to recruit like at her school with her friends. She'd be like, oh, I told so-and-so about the group we're going to start. They want to join. When are we doing this? And I was like, oh my God. Okay. I guess I have to do this because my daughter is not letting go of this idea. And so I knew that 
I needed help to do this. I knew that I had enough on my plate already. And so I approached one of my best friends and one of my daughter's chosen aunties, Marilyn Hollenquest. And I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this little group for Lupita, my daughter, and some of her homies. What do you think about this idea? And would you be down to help me like do this together? And my friend Marilyn was like, hell yeah, that is a super dope idea. And I'm down to help you do that. And so we ended up launching in December of 2014. And in terms of the difference of service and justice, I think that what struck me is when looking at the traditional elements of girl troops, there is this whole kind of element of service. And I feel like service is really based on what someone or something is lacking versus justice, which looks at what is something that everyone deserves, right? And justice is about being aware and about being critical of the systems, right, that create inequities. So for me, that was a really important difference. Wow. I just love hearing how this sprouted from this request from your daughter. (laughs) And then it led you on this amazing path that has led you here, which is so beautiful to hear the origin story. And what a dedicated mother you are to say yes and to just go for it and be so (laughs) creative and I really want to honor you and appreciate you for just doing it. And yeah. now, can you talk a little bit about the different types of badges that the monarchs earn? I've heard they range from radical bodies, coding, love, advocacy, pride and beauty, just to name a few. So what are the monarchs learning through these badges and how do you select which topics to explore? Yeah. So the topics are chosen based on two things. They're based on interest from the monarchs, right? And so with our first troop, we would constantly kind of be asking them, like, what are things that you want to do? What are things that you want to learn about? Or what are things you want to explore in this group? And so we would constantly have these brainstorming sessions with them. And based on the things that they would bring up, me and Marilyn would kind of sit with that and be like, oh, well, this ties into this topic. Let's make a whole badge around this. Because typically the monarchs will come up with activities and then we're like, oh, what's an issue that is tied to that activity, right? So the badges and the units come from the monarchs themselves. And also just in thinking about what are things that they're dealing with as young girls of color. And then also, almost as importantly, what is happening around them, right? What are they experiencing around them in their community? And so like you mentioned, we have so many different types of badges and units and that the range is pretty big, but to give you a better idea. So we have one radical bodies in the radical bodies badge, the monarchs learned self-defense. They learned about disability justice. They learned about fativism. They learned about consent. Another badge we have is called Pachamama justice, which is an environmental justice badge. And with that one, monarchs learned about what role do community gardens play in urban communities. They learned about like how to make their own vitamin water. They did a hike. We collaborated with Outdoor Afro, which is a national organization that is also based out of here in Oakland. Another badge is Radical Pride. And in that one, the monarchs learned about the LGBT community. They learned about the gender spectrum. They marched in Trans March. And then we have radical advocacy where the monarchs learned about community organizing. They were basically trained in the community organizing cycle. They got to meet the Lotus Huerta and see her documentary. They learned about how a bill becomes a law and all about how policy works. And then they got to brainstorm within themselves what are issues that they feel really impacted by and passionate about that's affecting them and their communities and created speaking points and also came up with solutions that they wanted to offer to policymakers on those issues. And that badge culminates in us taking the monarchs to the state capitol where they actually meet with legislators and actually share with them their concerns and pitch to them their solutions. That is so incredible. I'm just imagining what if all youth were able to go through programs like this. I feel like we'd live in a very different world. And I'm thinking back to my younger years and how much wasn't taught to me. And I'm sure so many of us were just conditioned in a totally different way. And the years of unlearning and unconditioning that it takes to wake up to what's the realities of 
this time and to imagine the radical monarchs diving into these really important, deep topics. And I love this. I feel so grateful for what you're doing. And I want to discuss one of the badges previously mentioned, which is the Radical Beauty Badge. And certainly in terms of unlearning and relearning, the work that we must do around beauty standards and self-worth is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And this is really an area that also coalesces with conversations on consumerism and the way that these standards are now manipulated to sell us product. So I'd love if you could talk a little bit more about the notion of being radically beautiful and how you explore this topic that is so vital to our experience moving through this world in our bodies and with girl identified youth. Yeah. So in this unit, we really kind of start off talking about what does it mean to be beautiful, right? What does it mean to be beautiful to ourselves, in our families, in our cultures, right? And we also talk about what does it mean to love parts of ourselves that are maybe hard to love, right? And how do those parts of ourselves that are maybe hard to love, how does that make us radically beautiful, right? And radically beautiful meaning like this is the way in which we are constructing beauty and we are defining beauty and we own our beauty and not the way we're being told by media or by society what beautiful is and looks like, right? And so we explore and have lots of conversations around that. And then we talk about media, right? And how does media constantly trying to sell us things to quote unquote, like fix ourselves or make us beautiful, right? And so it's fascinating. And the monarchs always have lots to say and are so aware of what's up, you know? Like it's really not so much about us telling them as them telling us. And we culminate that unit by the monarchs. They worked with some local herbalists who taught them how to make a natural lip balm and like how we can make things for ourselves to take care of ourselves, right? As a part of self-care and self-love to make ourselves feel beautiful and to really own the beauty we already have with products that aren't expensive and using natural things from our gardens. And so it's a really sweet unit. It's one of the first units that we do with the monarchs as kind of a grounding. Yeah. I'd like to transition to talking about the adult-centric culture in movement work. And I'm wondering if you can not only speak to the importance of bringing youth into social justice movements at an early age, but also share with us the wealth, abundance, and courage, and really beauty that is generated when young ones are involved in these issues that afflict their communities. Yes. And so I've been doing organizing and activism for like 20 years now. And in my experience in activism and organizing, the centering and the focus on building leadership within children is usually an afterthought, if at all, in my experience. And so I feel like young people aren't usually given the opportunity to engage or to be activated in social justice work until maybe they're in high school. And that's if they're lucky enough to attend a school, right, that has adult allies or that has ethnic studies or that has clubs that tackle these issues, right? And so 
I felt like there needs to be a space where we actually center children in this work because this is the world that our children are going to be inheriting, right? And as a parent, I think that I was a young mother and I think that as I was raising my children and because I had them as I was organizing and participating in activism, I often thought about where is their place in this work beyond them just coloring pages while I'm facilitating meetings or actions, right? Or they're in childcare, but it's like, no, where actually are their voices and how are we actually developing their leadership in this work? So yeah, that's really been my experience and how adult-centric movement work has been in the past and how I really wanted to shift that with the work of Radical Monarchs. Mm, So beautiful. And I feel like any time we talk about movement work and organizing, regardless of the age demographic, the topic of burnout always comes up. Mm. And I believe this is something you've spoken about before, that you and co-founder Marilyn Hollenquest were really acutely aware that you'd have to develop a program that doesn't burn the group out. So I'm curious how you approach this as well as what movements and organizations in general could learn about longevity and sustainability should they center the idea that we cannot expend individuals beyond their capacity. Yes, this is a big one for us. So one of our organizational values is sustainability. And we were incredibly intentional about picking that as a value. This is something that we work really hard to embody as women of color who are co-founders who both have a long history of activism and organizing and working within the nonprofit industrial complex. So we're incredibly mindful of this, not only with each other, because we practice this with each other as co-founders, but also with our monarchs, right? And so many of us in this work, like you mentioned, have experienced burnout and breakdown. So while working with little ones, we recruit from third to fifth grade. It's like, okay, we don't want them to feel burnt out of movement, social justice work by the time they're in sixth grade, right? We're about building long-term change makers and movement makers. So we're incredibly intentional about how we, one, scaffold topics and issues so to not overwhelm, right? And then equally as important, we're really big on lifting up the wins, right? The wins in this work, um, which I think is so important to be able to cultivate hopefulness, right? And then every unit and every badge has an element of action. So that's where monarchs get to feel like they are actually in charge of creating some sort of change, right, about that topic or that issue. Another organizational value that we have is joy. Joy is a big one with us. We're working with kids. And in general, all of us deserve joy, right? (laughs) Even us who are adults. So joy is a big one. So we make space for that. Like, laughing as medicine and playing as medicine. And so although we have these badges and we have these units and some of these units and topics can be heavy and can be hard, we're really mindful of how are we cultivating joy within this work and how are we making sure there's laughter and there's play and there's unstructured time, right? For monarchs to be able to enjoy each other. I love hearing you say this. (laughs) And uh, I think joy is so important. And I've thought about that too, in terms of burning out the young ones before they even start to take on more of the responsibility of movement work. But I I do think that there's something too, like how we're inspired to make justice sustainable for the young ones. We should also take that advice for ourselves too, because adults are burning out left and right. And that's not a great example for the young ones if They're going, oh, well, look at the adults who are really just miserable doing this work because we really want the young ones to want to do this work and not look up to us going like, this doesn't look too good over here. People are really tired and just wiped out and feeling exhausted by it because, you know, it's huge work. It's lifelong work. And I really appreciate how much time and, and care you put into that. And yeah, I'm also thinking about just the importance of finding your voice, which is something that many of us, especially those who identify as girls and women, we may not be able to explore until much later in life. Right. And in preparing for this interview, I came across a quote from a monarch who shared, quote, without being in the radical monarchs, 
I would have had a hard time standing up for myself. If I was in a situation and someone said something that I thought was really offensive, I probably wouldn't have said anything, even if I really wanted to. The Radical Monarchs taught me that my voice matters regardless of if people like it or not. That's an important lesson everyone should learn, end quote. And gosh, I know, I reflect on this personally in terms of just the importance of finding my own voice in honor of the earth and Mm. the vital necessity of us having this ability right now. So we can't afford to wait for girl identified youth to exercise their voices until womanhood. Mm -hmm. We really want them to feel like their voice is valuable right now. And yeah, so I'm wondering if you could speak to the importance of cultivating self-determination at an early age. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that we hear from adults is, I wish I had this when I was younger, right? Including this is something that me and Marilyn have said ourselves and was really in the back of our heads as we were creating this program. And I think that many of us come into social justice work or movement work a little bit later in life. And so for myself and Marilyn, it was City College, right? Where we became activated. And so looking at where we're at now as 40-year-old women, wow, where would we be? Which is not bad. We're in a good place. But where would we be in terms of our power if we had been exposed to this or given this type of space in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade? I mean, it's like we'd be unstoppable, right? So activating and creating the space where young people and monarchs can have that sense of self-worth and self-determination at a much younger age than when most of us were able to learn that or are still learning that, right, is such a powerful way to create revolution and to be resistant to what larger society wants us to do, right? Which is to shrink. I've noticed another theme that is so present in the work that you do is that of sisterhood, but not the sort of generic umbrella version of sisterhood, but one that honestly acknowledges the tremendous importance of a sisterhood that recognizes the need to have relationship with those that can empathize with us. You know, a sisterhood that mirrors one's experiences as reprieve from a world that denies this for so many So I'd love if you could talk about the sisterhood that is cultivated in the Radical Monarchs and how does it support collective power and leadership? Yes. Sisterhood is huge. One, I think that it's really powerful that me and Marilyn, who are co-founders, are also best friends. So I think that we get to kind of model what this fierce sisterhood looked like within our friendship. We call each other, we're like sister friends, we're sister wives, we're like work wives, right? We have a unit in 
in the Radical Monarchs that's called the Radical Love Unit. And the Radical Love Unit is all about interdependence and what does it mean to cultivate relationships that are interdependent and how do we learn the difference between a healthy and a toxic friendship. And we actually ground them in a quote that I love by Alice Walker that says, no person is your friend who demands your silence or denies your right to grow. And we talk about what does it look like to have a friendship where you are reflecting back to each other your brilliance or your strength and that is actually encouraging you to grow and not saying like, oh, you've changed, like that's a bad thing, right? And so it ends up kind of unearthing all these conversations about what it means to support each other's growth and success and to shift the narrative of competition to like, when I shine, you shine, right? Like we're in this together. There's room for all of us here. And so that is really how we root, how we ground and root ourselves in this idea of fierce sisterhood. I love knowing that you are doing this in sisterhood and you have your sister work wife with you. That's so beautiful. I definitely have those relationships in my life and it makes it so (laughs) much better. I love doing creative projects with people that I love. It is honestly one of the best parts of my life and to do movement work with our chosen family in that way. These people that are these soulmates that come into our lives is so important and I'm sure that that relationship really seeps through to the radical monarchs that you work with because I'm sure they feel that the leadership is really respecting and loving each other and grateful for each other and what a difference that makes when we can feel that about the people we're creating with and how that reverberates to the folks who get to be a part of those creations so I love hearing that and I'm thinking that there is this popular notion that we can't talk about certain things with our little ones or that if we do, we need to be approached or these topics need to be approached in layers or peeled back over time. But this is certainly not the model that the radical monarchs prescribe to, at least from what I can see. And I'd also mention that Mm -hmm. to be able to choose what you do and don't talk about varies greatly in terms of privilege. If you live in a county that suffers from severe air pollution, your child will know about environmental injustice through experience. Or if you are a person of color, then you have no choice but to have conversations about police brutality. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how have you been able to develop a curriculum and environment where young ones are able to process and carry on conversations about what is unfolding and come away feeling empowered from it. Yeah. So me and Marilyn met in grad school. We were both at SF State getting our master's in ethnic studies and following graduating from SF State, we went on to work in the youth development field. We both worked in countless schools and lots of different nonprofits working with young people. And so in that work, we learned and created a lot of curriculum for youth programming. So having that background and experience of trial and error, right, because it's not like you come out just knowing how to do it, was incredibly helpful for when we were thinking about creating the curriculum for Radical Monarchs and fun, right? We both love to create curriculum. We both love working with young people. We did it for so many years. And the way in which we do that in the Radical Monarchs is one, there isn't anything that we shy away from, I would say. I think that we take any topic or issue on. I think if the monarchs are asking about it, then we have to have a conversation about it. I think that what is maybe different about the way in which we do that work is that I think there is something to be said about scaffolding and about layering. So we don't only talk about colorism in the Black Lives Matter unit, or we don't only talk about trans identity in the Radical Pride unit. The units and the badges are all incredibly intersectional. And so therefore, it's not like we have to talk about every single thing that has to do with that topic in that unit, because no, this will come up when we talk about beauty. This will come up when we talk about environmental justice. All these things overlap each other. And so I think that's an important part of the way in which we do our work in Radical Monarchs. In addition to that, every badge and unit has three parts. So the first part is 
what we call a grounding session. So that's the first meeting on a specific unit and badge where we really kind of take inventory of what do monarchs already know about this topic? We're not coming into these meetings or this work assuming that the monarchs don't know anything. They already have a wealth of knowledge. So it's about what do they know? Like, what do you already know and hear about this issue or this topic or think about this topic? And then also like, what are your questions? What do you want to know? What do you want to learn about this topic? And then based on what we get from that first session, the middle part of the badges and the units is all experiential learning. So it's field trips, it's them going out into the community and seeing this work in action or talking to people that are connected to this work in action. So they're able to really experience it. And then the last part, every unit, like I mentioned earlier, has an element of action, has an element of them creating something. So there's always this piece where they feel empowered to create some sort of change. And I think that is a really important piece of the work that creates and cultivates hopefulness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I was seeing this clip where two radical monarchs asked Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for advice on young women of color who want to enter politics. And she responds by saying, quote, Stop trying to navigate systems of power Mm. and start building your own power. There are so many subconscious forces that make us try to act like somebody else. But when you're a woman of color, there are so many things about you that is non-conforming, end quote. Yes. And I think especially after the past four years and looking at the nominations for the 2020 presidential election, it's pretty darn clear that this political system is not going to give us what we want. So as we begin to draw to a close, I'd love if you could share how the radical monarchs are teaching a generation to build their own power. And at the same time, what is our role in helping to create a world which we may not see come to fruition, but is nevertheless dedicated to future generations and nonconformity? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, as adult allies, I think our job is to listen, right? I think our job is to listen to young people, to listen to what they're feeling, what they're seeing, what they know. And I think that it's so important for us to get out of the way and to let young people lead. I think that a lot of times, like I mentioned earlier, we underestimate our young people. And so I think that it's so important for us to just listen to them and let them lead. And then equally as important to partner with them and to support them, to ask them, what are the things that I can do as an adult ally to support you, right? Or to help you achieve this goal or this dream or this change that you want to see happen in your community, in your school, in your neighborhood. I think that as adult allies, there's a quote that I hear that speaks to me often that says, be the adult you needed when you were a kid. And so I think that that's something that is constantly in the back of my mind in being a longtime youth worker and now a co-founder. Gosh, this has just been such an uplifting conversation and really leaves me with a sense of not just hope, but excitement thinking about this younger generation of young ones who are really 
being guided by adult allies, which I love that you say that, in a way that's honest and straightforward, but also really creative and joyful. And just talking to so many of the things that get left out from conventional education that I think a lot of us adults now have had to kind of struggle through. And it it takes a lot of effort to try to learn about these things later in life. And I think if people already knew them going into their adult life, we would just live in a really different world and we would be able to communicate so much differently with one another. And yeah, thank you so much, Anna Yvette, for Mm -hmm. just being so committed and courageous to start this thing. Like, just go for it. I love how you started it. And I love that your daughters were the catalyst for this and that your motherhood is so dedicated to them and to the other young ones. I I love hearing this and I could imagine you just being so excited to build curriculum. Yeah. and, And I know throughout the years, there have been ample requests across the country to create local chapters or share the curricula and programs that you've been creating. And I'm wondering if you could share what the Radical Monarchs are doing now and what are the plans on the horizon And then maybe how can listeners get involved or support the growth of the monarchs? Yes. So we have graduated two troops. So troops stay together as a cohort for three years and then they graduate. And so we've had our first two troops graduate. So we now have two crews of alumni, which is exciting, of which we're still very much working with in our alumni program that helps support these new troops that we've launched. And so this last fall, We launched four new troops here in the Bay Area. So we have two new troops in Oakland, one in San Francisco, and one in Richmond. And we plan on expanding to LA within this next year. And so there's been a lot of growth and a lot of movement, which has been incredibly exciting. And I love seeing the alumni support these newer, younger monarch troops. And so they attend the troop meetings or they attend events and help support and kind of mentor, which is really sweet to see. And then right now we're living through these wild pandemic times. And so we had to kind of like think about, okay, so how do we shift in this moment? How are we creating space for our monarchs in this moment? And so we launched a radical workshop series, which actually is happening right now. And we contracted a bunch of amazing, fierce, queer, trans women, people of color, to facilitate these workshops with our monarchs virtually. And so we have an artist doing a wheat pasting and street art activism workshop. We have a poetry workshop. We have how to make fire cider. We have one on comic book art. And then we also have one that's a sound bath and meditation workshop. We're screening a sweet short film on a trans mother and daughter relationship. And so that's been really exciting to roll out for our monarchs during this time. And then we created these, we're calling them our pandemic joy kits. And so we had a local vendor that we work with create these little radical monarch drawstring backpacks. And inside there, we gave each monarch a face mask, which is super cute and designed and created handmade by a fierce woman of color artist. We gave them a rose quartz that also came from a black owned botanica here in the Bay, a rose quartz crystal. We had another artist create a radical coloring book, crayons. We put a comic book in there. We put some stress relief tea. (laughs) And our intention with these pandemic joy kits was for every monarch to be able to find inspiration, comfort, and joy with each item. And so that's something that we've done within this last week in kind of response to this pandemic shelter in place and thinking about how are we centering the young people that we work with through this time. And then in terms of how folks can support us and keep up with us, we have our website, which is www.radicalmonarchs.org. We have a Facebook and we have an Instagram. Our Instagram is, I think, what is most recent. We really keep that updated and post on there. It's the best way to kind of follow us. And it's Radical Monarchs is our handle on Instagram. And I think that 
the best way to support our growth is really with funding, to be honest. I think we're a small, scrappy organization. And I think that we have the desire to continue to expand and grow wherever radical monarch troops are needed and wanted but we need to build our capacity to do that, right? And so I think that we've done a lot with the little that we have and that we want to do more. We want to reach more young people. And so you can become a monthly donor. You can donate through our website. If you have connections with foundations or with funders, connect us to them, talk to them about us. You can send them the link to our mini documentary, our full documentary that has been traveling internationally for the last year now. There are lots of ways that folks can support us and support our growth. Mm, Wonderful. Well, we will also be posting that online so folks can follow the links to you. But yeah, Anna Yvette, before we completely end our convo, I just want to give you the floor. If there's anything that you want to mention about the Radical Monarchs that we haven't gone over thus far. I really love hearing any stories or even just, yeah, stories or experiences that you've had with your first troops. If there's anything that comes to mind, I'd love to hear that. Hmm. I mean, there's so many stories, right, in this work, but I think that, I mean, I feel humbled and grateful to do this work every day. Every day, I am just like, I am so grateful to be able to do this work and moments where I feel most proud of the work that we're doing is when I get to witness the growth of these monarchs. And so, for example, our troop one monarchs that have graduated now two years ago are now 15 and 16 and came in when they were like 10 (laughs) and seeing them move on from the monarchs still stay connected, but seeing who they've become in their school communities and their neighborhoods. We have monarchs that graduate from our program that have done murals in our neighborhood who were once really quiet and barely ever raised their hands, who ended up running for student government, right? And being student body president in their schools. I mean, it's endless in terms of seeing the types of connections and growth that they've done following being in the Radical Monarchs. And so for me, I think that is what I feel most proud of as a co-founder and what motivates me to continue to do this work. Mm, Yes. I love hearing that. Just the growth of these little ones that you've been able to help usher into their teenage years. And what an important time. I remember that time in my life was really confusing and just strange right you know so like having some adult allies to help during especially that transition is pretty epic so uh, i just love your work i'm so happy we got to speak today and thank you so much anybody who's listening please do look into radical monarchs more and support this work we really need to uplift our youth because they will be inheriting quite a strange world so yeah We need to step up and really help out. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Wild Podcast. I'm audio producer Andrew Stores. The music you heard today was from Lady Moon and the Eclipse and the Mina Birds. I'd like to thank our host and founder, Ayana Young, as well as the rest of our podcast production team, Francesca Glassbell, Carter Lou McElroy, Erica Ekram, and Melanie Younger.